caught? Was he stealing money? <laughs> Who in finance knows what happens when you uh, sign up for an account? We have to go back and verify identity, right? He got nailed for computer fraud, wire fraud, and mail fraud. But what busted him was the US Patriot Act. The banks that he was working with went so far as to contact him, talk to him on the phone. You're stealing money. I'm not stealing. This is a standard process. This is what business logic flaws are all about, is expanding the realm of what's possible, forcing it to do things that it's allowed to do. He was caught by the Patriot Act because he was using forged identities. So if he used real names, he would have been okay? Probably, yeah. <laughs> if, uh, we're thinking, if he used real names, what would have been a crime? Do you, have mul do you have multiple uh, email accounts? Plan B. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're making a little bit more money there. We're making maybe small five-figure sums if, uh, if we don't get caught by the uh, U.S. Secrets, uh, by the Patriot Act first. But let's make a little bit more. and let's, uh, let's try with e-coupons. And if you've ordered anything online from any number of, let's say, let's say airlines, e-commerce shops, you're familiar with coupon codes, promo codes, discount codes, whatever they, and they choose to give them. Numbers that you plug in, you get a little bit of a discount on your order. So e-coupons are used all over the place. So there was a particular large online retailer. I can't, we cannot cite the reference yet, but uh, one, this is, uh, when they first developed this program, they were selling re really big dollar figure items, and they were handing out coupon codes, but these coupon codes were really uh, Amex one-time credit card numbers, so big 16-digit IDs. And they weren't sequential, but they were pseudo-sequential. Let's say they, for our intents here, they were predictable. So you would put them in there, and you know, coupons were be worth you know, a couple of bucks, maybe a couple of hundred dollars, depending. And when they first launched the program, they did their security analysis, and they said, you know what, we should only allow three coupons and no more per order. It makes sense you know, to compartmentalize whatever risk is there to a single order. So when this program became really, really popular, and people wanted to order uh, items worth m multiple tens of thousands, they wanted to add more coupons. So they dropped this if statement somewhere down the road and somebody found out. So what the person was doing was they were cycling through all these coupon codes, finding the valid ones and applying it to their orders. Orders worth 50 grand were bought for mere hundreds of dollars or just dollars. And the problem went unnoticed for a long, long time until there was a system com capacity planning exercise, and in the middle of the night, somebody's like, okay, well, how big do we need to build, scale up this system? The CPUs were spiking at 90% because this person was just cycling through all these numbers over and over again. They're like, well, well wh why is this happening? This should, it's the middle of the night. No one should be ordering anything. So they figured out what was going on. They investigated, and they brought in the FBI, and the FBI was trying to track this particular incident, and uh, the items were shipped to a, uh, a non-existent address, but they never got sent back. So what was happening is that this person was colluding with a, a mail carrier who was intercepting the merchandise, grabbing it, and that was the end of that. So what was interesting is that uh, what we found you know, during our research of this, that coupons are not currency, only a tool for marketing. So instead of the whole FBI thing, they are starting to investigate it uh, by the Secret Service, and now they face probably what's infinitely worse, mail fraud. Okay, you guys are all web security specialists, but most of you guys are at least involved. OWASP has gotten huge. How many of you guys still bank online and shop online and do that sort of stuff? I travel, so I, I, I do it too. I do everything online. Now, what's really fun about this is, you know that little panicked moments, especially during the holiday season, we wanna order this stuff, make sure it gets shipped in time so we can wrap it and give away our presents, right? There's that little moment where you submit your order and it says, don't, don't do anything. Let this process finish. It's going to come back in a couple of seconds. You change your mind. You click cancel. What happens? You're checking your email. You're making sure the order canceled. Nothing came through. Well, there was a particular instance where uh, I don't think she's a security researcher. <laughs> I can picture my mom doing this. Quantina Moore Perry, 33-year-old lady in Greensboro, North Carolina, was shopping online. She was on QVC. She saw some things she liked ordered them, backed out of the order, canceled the order, and a uh, little piece of magic happened. The order was still fulfilled. She got what she was shopping for without paying for it. And she did it again. <laughs> and again, and again. Now, interesting. If you're doing this volume of ordering, 18, was it 100? 
1,800 items online, and this is all P UPS shipping, you're gonna know this shipping individual fairly well, <laughs> right? Now, what do you do with all this stuff? Most of us are from the United States. Yay, capitalism, baby, yeah! What do you do? You sell it on eBay, make a little coin. Free stuff, supply chain management, it's brilliant. What's illegal about this? Speak up, guys. <laughs> Why is resale? Josh. Oh, it wasn't you. Okay. There's nothing inherently illegal specifically about what she's doing. And she turned a very tidy profit. How do you catch this? This is allowed activity. How, ma how many of you guys have ordered or, and then canceled an order in the last year? There's got to be a huge volume of this happening. How do you detect this in the logs? How do you find it? Show them the uh, detection system. This is IDS for dummies. This is how we'd catch my mom. They were just forwarding it. Hi, mail carrier. Nice to see you. Slap, slap. New labels. Handed them right back to the mail carrier. Took them right back. What? They started receiving these boxes and QVC packaging never opened. <laughs> red light comes on, they make a phone call, talk to QVC. They had no clue. <laughs> the lady finally pleaded guilty in federal court to wire fraud. The question is, you know, with these types of flaws, is it legal, is it not? It's not stealing. On the FTC website, it says, what happens when I, am I obligated to return or pay for merchandise I never ordered? No. If you receive merchandise that you did not order, you have a legal right to keep it as a free gift. <laughs> so, so uh, don't do these things, okay? <laughs> this is only meant to question your ethics, not you know, put you, you know, make you meet Bubba or anything like that, right? All right, so uh, one of the questions, you know, if you're if you are a web security expert or work in the security industry as a penetration tester or whatever, the question you a lot of get, you, probably a lot of you get, is, can you hack banks, <laughs> right? And uh, so the interesting thing is, you know, when I've you know talked to people about this, is that you know you can hack one bank at a time if you want, but there are other ways to hack banks. You can actually hack hundreds of banks at the same time if you know what you're doing, and you can uh, hack them against unhardened targets. We call these uh, ASPs. ASPs provide a service to a lot of times small and regional banks that say, okay, we don't want to write our banking software, we want to host and manage this infrastructure, you do it for us. But the interesting thing that happens with a lot of ASPs is that once they got your money, they're really not incentivized to keep improving the security or provide any security at all other than the bare minimum. So one of the ASPs that uh, we ran into uh, early on was, uh, again, hosted regional uh, credit unions, about 600 of them. And uh, they had this really uh, sophisticated uh, URL scheme here on how they controlled access to the site. Uh, if you were a banking customer on the system, you had one unique client ID. So each and every person, if you're a customer of the ASP, got one unique ID for our purposes here. Let's just say number is 10. Um, you had a bank ID. Now, you can run multiple financial applications on each uh, on, on the system. You can have one for private banking. Uh, commercial banking, you know, savings account, check-ins account, whatever. So you had incremental numbers there. And then there was account IDs here. And you, there's, you know, for each one of your end customers with a check-in account, they would get a unique account number that associated to the bank ID. So, you know, White Hat's, you know, so how do we hack 600 banks? And, you know, White Hat, we're really smart guys. We, we go in like the super hackers we are. And uh, we said, okay, let's start with this account ID here. We rotate this number, move it down to 99, and we get this gigantic red error message.